Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is DeAndre Calvert. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the Program in Practical Policy Engagement here at the Ford School. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Young Leaders and Public Service event with our special guest, uh, Mr. Michael Randall, who is the Senior Director of Community Impact uh, for the American Heart Association. Uh, right now, I just want to make sure everyone knows that this event is being recorded. And I'd like to acknowledge Miriam Nagarin, who is our administrative assistant and our tech guru, who will be helping uh, behind the scenes, and also our associate director, uh, Ms. Cindy Bank. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael. He is one of our community partners with uh, the PCLP, the Independent Study, through the Program in Practical Policy Engagement. Uh, we have worked uh, for the last two semesters now, uh, in the spring and in the fall, on tobacco issues within public schools in the state of Michigan. You know, Michael wears many hats and actually was just promoted to this to this current position. So congratulations on that. Um, but it is, it's is—it's been an honor to get to know him, um, working with our students and seeing all the work that the American Heart Association does. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Randall. Awesome, thank you, DeAndre and uh, Cindy and Miriam. Thank you for having me. Um, it, it's actually been um, a tremendous uh, pleasure to be working with the, the Ford School um, in this um, work with uh, uh, tobacco related issues and vaping issues within our public schools. Um, the American Heart Association for a number of years has had a, a interest in um, preventing tobacco usage for obvious reasons. Um, of course, tobacco use is, uh, is uh, prevalent in individuals who uh, end up leading a life of uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, however, we've seen a resurgence of uh, tobacco usage is primarily in our, our younger population, uh, middle school and high school age individuals um, because of the advent and the uh, distribution of vaping products. Um, and so there's been a renewed focus on this issue. Um, and uh, we were uh, blessed and fortunate to be connected with uh, DeAndre through uh, LaSonia Forte. Um, uh, through a connection there, and it's really just been uh, really off to the races. We we developed the practicum. We were able to submit that and get some uh, students interested in that. So we're in our second semester, um, really looking at school policies um, and how those policies support students uh, in their journey to prevent tobacco usage or uh, stop and, and create cessation opportunities for students who are addicted. So. This is a uh, epidemic uh, that our young people are dealing with. Um, and it's really awesome to have uh, students from the Ford School really help us look at these policies and figure out how to engage um, uh, K through 12 education when it comes to developing policy that's supportive and not punitive in nature. So uh, once again, DeAndre, thanks for, for having me, appreciate it. My pleasure. So uh, now at this time, you can take an opportunity to explain your, your journey, how you got, got in this position and some of the work that you do with the American Heart Association. Absolutely. So, um, so I currently serve as the Senior Director of Community Impact for the American Heart Association. Um, and that pr primarily covers the entire state of Michigan when it comes to what we call our health strategies work. Um, and that work falls into three buckets. So the first bucket is um, heavily focused on our, our clinical partners. So we work with uh, large health systems like the University of Michigan uh, Health System, uh, Beaumont, the Henry Fords of the world. Um, we also work with a, 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 a lot of small, fairly qualified health clinics as well, free clinics um, and, and other uh, primary care providers as well. And a lot of that work with um, our clinical partners is focused on improving health outcomes for patients that are disproportionately impacted by uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so we have several quality improvement programs that we offer to our um, clinical partners that are based on uh, the American Heart Association guidelines around cholesterol management, uh, hypertension management, um, and more increasingly type two diabetes management. So um, you probably are familiar with, you know, the American Heart Association guidelines, 2017 American Cardio, um, American College 
cardiology, <laughs> American College of Cardiology, I'm sorry, I always messed that one up, um, guidelines that um, really uh, help, you know, keep guardrails in terms of how uh, physicians and cardiologists are caring for patients that are dealing with these chronic conditions. So I kind of act as a consultant. I work um, very closely with quality improvement directors, uh, chief medical officers, I'm really looking at those guidelines and creating uh, protocols and algorithms to help improve clinical workflow, um, create efficiency, and really prevent the misdiagnosis of hypertension and cholesterol and other things. We also work primarily in, um, in medication adherence as well. So statins, um, aspirin, uh, other you know, uh, beta blockers, other drugs and prescription drugs that are used to um, help um, individuals that are suffering from um, chronic conditions like uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke. Um, so that's one bucket. The other bucket um, really focuses on our um, community engagement. And so this is kind of where the Ford School comes in. Um, we have several areas that we work in um, in terms of uh, creating what we like to call um, environments that make the healthy choice the easy choice. So a lot of those things are based in policy. So um, like take tobacco, for instance, right? Um, you know, there's laws around, you know, age and possession and usage of tobacco that help uh, safeguard, um, you know, uh, industries to prey on young people, right? Um, to sell, you know, cigarettes to individuals that are underage, right? There's laws that protect against that. So it helps to, you know, create an environment that's conducive of, um, lower tobacco usage, right? And what we've seen increasingly is, you know, the vaping industry um, has taken advantage of, of loopholes and laws and created products that are very uh, addictive and um, are being promoted directly to young people. Um, so we really try to look at policy systems and environmental change that we can um, that we can help municipalities and um, and even even states and even on the federal level help create policies that um, create environments that hopefully help people make healthy choices when it comes to their cardiovascular health which we found by science is a um, is a proxy for overall optimal health so um, tobacco falls into that we also work a lot in environmental spaces and so clean water clean air, um, we also work uh, with transportation organizations providing um, transportations to low income individuals. We work a lot in that space. We also work in affordable housing uh, because affordable housing also is a proxy for uh, life uh, trajectory and, and life expectancy. Um, so a lot of our work, uh, work you know, is focused on that area and really looking at how we can create policies and systems and environmental changes to help improve those environments. Um, and the third bucket, uh, really is our volunteer focus. Our, you know, we are a volunteer health organization. So we've been uh, fortunate and blessed um, to work with fantastic organizations all throughout the world that are, are interested in, in, in cardiovascular health, are interested in overall health and, and, and reducing some of these disparities that we see in this area. Um, uh, again, disproportionately impacting people of color and women um, and low income individuals. Um, so my work in that area is just con continuing to harness um, and, uh, and cultivate relationships um, with organizations that, that care um, and, and understand our mission and wanna help us move forward. Um, so that's pretty much my role at the American Heart Association. Um, the, how I got to the AHA is, is, is kind of a, an interesting story. I always say that, you know, I didn't really choose population health and public health. It kind of chose me. Um, I'm, a, I'm an urban planner by training. Uh, out of college, I wanted to do uh, affordable housing. I wanted to work for a local um, nonprofit housing developer or even uh, working in a city planning department or something like that with a focus on community development and, um, and housing development. Um, I had an internship at the Ypsilanti Housing Commission not too far from campus. Um, and um, I, I had my internship. I felt it went well. And um, I was not offered a job. That was, I was hoping to be offered a job. But I was offered um, a, a, an AmeriCorps position. The actual um, um, position was for 
a, uh, a health navigator within the Washtenaw County Health Department. And um, the executive director at the Ypsilanti Housing Commission connected me with that opportunity. And I spent two years as an AmeriCorps worker working within the health department. And I primarily work um, in benefits access. So I help people get connected with um, uh, Medicaid insurance, uh, Medicare insurance, um, marketplace insurance. Um, this is what this was in 2013 and 2014. So this is uh, right when the Affordable Care Act was passed and um, Medicaid was expanded in the state of Michigan. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, overnight, uh, we had close to 25,000 newly eligible individuals in the county. So it was my job to go out in the county and build capacity to get all of these people enrolled. Um, and it was a challenge. We had very small mini grants that we can help churches and um, and schools and anyone that would, you know, anybody, anyone that cared, <laughs> um, uh, we would uh, give them small grants so they can buy laptops and, uh, and a printer and, and scanners so they can uh, assist individuals in the community that needed to be connected with uh, newly uh, newly passed Medicaid expansion, right? It was a very exciting time. Um, and that was my first, um, that was my first, I would say, engagement when it came to like population health, um, population level health care, um, you know, looking at counties, right? Not just looking at like direct service or point of care service, like a nurse caring for a patient or a doctor caring for a patient. Um, we were looking at increasing levels in the tens of thousands in terms of people that were enrolled. Um, and so it got me interested in looking at um, what were some of the barriers or what were some of the policies that um, could be in place to help make these processes more efficient. So I would look at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the role they played. You know, I would look at the county health department and the role that they played and, and also other social services and the roles they played in terms of this ecosystem that was either um, um, sometimes very helpful and very useful, but sometimes created several barriers um, to individuals that were accessing healthcare. Um, so from there, um, I uh, went to a Medicare managed care uh, provider called America Healthcare to us. Um, it's an integrated care organization. And that was my first introduction to really uh, looking at urban problems. So that um, um, that organization serviced the tri-county area, so Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne County. And um, most of the patients that were serviced under this integrated care organization um, were in the city of Detroit. And I, once again, was a healthcare navigator. Um, and I was, you know, looking for hard to reach patients, right? I um, mean, connecting them with services, connecting them with primary care, um, and also doing social determinants of health screening. So um, I had patients that were living in very high levels of poverty, individuals that, you know, live in homes with no heat, um, individuals that um, had live sewage in their basement, individuals that didn't have uh, roofs and were using a tarp for, uh, for a roof. Um, so these were uh, extremely impoverished uh, um, conditions, and I was tasked to connect them with healthcare. So once again, looking at those barriers, and and knowing that, um, you know, these organizations were funded by CMS. These were Medicare-funded organizations. However, we were still having issues connecting patients with their um, with their health coverage. Um, so once again, I'm ruminating. I'm in the I'm in my car in 95 degree weather, and I'm looking for hard to reach patients. I'm knocking on doors, and I'm thinking like, what are the systemic issues that are creating this? Right? Like, does this individual know even know that they've been enrolled into this health plan? So oftentimes, you know, Medicaid uh, recipients they get auto enrolled in the health plan. They don't even know that they have it. Right? And so I would knock on their door, and they would say, Well, who are you? I'm from AmeriHealth. What is AmeriHealth? That's your insurance. I didn't know I had that insurance. What is that? They may have went to the emergency room and got connected with a social worker and a social worker um, enrolled them in the healthcare coverage. They never followed up. And so the state just enrolled them um, automatically, right? And so imagine going years without actually knowing you have healthcare coverage and your teeth are rotting out. You're going deaf and you don't have a, a hearing aid. You're going blind and you don't have 
you don't have um, glasses, right? But you've always had this coverage, right? You just didn't know, right? These are some of the things that I was experiencing day in and day out. Um, you know, and, and one day um, I just got a call and it was a woman named Jenny Shalipo from the American Art Association asking me if I wanted to apply for a community impact director position. And I was like, absolutely. Um, because I was familiar with the American Art Association. I, you know, I had worked with clinics that were enrolled in some of the quality improvement programs. Um, really didn't have a, 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 a I, I didn't have an extensive understanding and knowledge of what the American Art Association does, but I knew they focused on like a population level with a bunch of individuals and they were really heavily focused on like advocacy, awareness and policy, which is kind of where I wanted to go. Um, so I joined the American Art Association uh, three and a half years ago. Um, and, and it's been awesome, you know, taking all of that experience from the front line um, and then figuring out how we can use the platform of the American Art Association um, to reduce barriers. Do the barriers still exist? Absolutely. Um, but I think that, you know, organizations like the AHA, which has historically been focused on research, um, recently has looked at, you know, social determinants of health, looking at these barriers that I experience on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the field, and they're actually looking at ways to solve it. <laughs> you know, hiring individuals like me, um, was not something that the AHA did, um, but they're really focused on those social determinants, which uh, by the way, 80 to 90% of heart disease is preventable, right? And where we see the pre prevention happening is reducing these risk factors when it comes to that 89%. And those are the social determinants, right? The social factors, the transportation, the access to food, housing, um, air quality, water quality, uh, education, you know, things like that. Those are where those 80 to 90 percent of risk factors live, and so you know if we're ever gonna you know stem the tide of the number one killer, which is heart disease, you know organizations like the AHA, the CDC, WHO, they have to start thinking about these social determinants um, if we're actually gonna move the needle. So um, yeah, that's that's pretty much you know my story. I was born and raised at Ipsy, so not far from U of M's campus. Um, and um, I've experienced these uh, personally, you know, you know, coming from uh, from Ypsilanti um, and you know, working class background. So it's really cool to to bring all that experience and um, and help you know craft initiatives and policy at the AHA that that's meaningful. Thank you so much for that, Michael. And it, it's so interesting that the journey you take, but all with the uh, with the specific goal of being able to, you know, help those and communities that don't necessarily have the access that uh, others might. So at this point, we will jump into our, our Q&A. We want this to be a dialogue. So please raise your hand to ask a question or you can feel free to type it in the chat. But right now I see that Nathan has his hand raised and feel free to, uh, to ask your question. What's up, everybody? How's it going, Michael? Nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Um, actually, it's interesting. I, I, I work in uh, Medicaid right now. I work for the state of Maine, and it's a Medicaid accountable care organization. And so basically, I'm a payer, right? And so you're, I hear you saying this, all this stuff. I'm interested now from the standpoint of the American Heart Association and your experience in working with managed care. What ways do you think that those two organizations, those two styles of organizations, both involved in healthcare, but kind of in different aspects of healthcare, how do you think that they could more effectively work together in order to kind of facilitate better outcomes for Medicaid members, right? I think that's something that I'm constantly trying to figure out how can we get more of these healthcare stakeholders involved in working in the right direction at the same pace, you know? Oh man, Nathan. <laughs> well, first of all, we, we need to get you into the AHA, number one. <laughs> I'm into it, man. I'm I mean, into it. <laughs> we need, um, it's so funny you, you asked that and awesome, ACOs, ICOs, very similar, uh, you know, very similar organizations. Um, and I just had a call today about, um, you know, how we can bridge that gap, you know, in terms of the the goals of an integrated care or accountable care organization and what the American Heart Association does. And um, I think about HEDIS measures um, and, and, and CMS star rating um, and quality improvement goals 
that oftentimes keep these integrated care organizations or ACOs open, right? It keeps them in business, right? Looking at improving their quality of care, that's how they're able to um, continue to get uh, funded through, uh, you know, CMS um, and, um, and, and and other organizations. So I think that we need more organizations <laughs> uh, uh, that have individuals like me and you uh, in their organization, if that makes sense. I mean, um, I, I came to the American Art Association and I would, you know, I, I would say these things like we really need to work with more ACOs and ICOs because I see the synergy and, you know, oftentimes it's like, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, but sometimes it, you know, it may fall on deaf ears of individuals, don't, as I, I've already said, like he just measures and people may not know what that means, but you do because you, you work in, in the, in the space. Um, so the, the, our goals are very similar, but the lingo and the, and the vernacular and the lexicon is different. Um, so it's going to take individuals like us to help be uh, a translator, if you will, um, because the AHA wants people to use their guidelines when it comes to hypertension management, cholesterol management, type 2 diabetes management, and ACOs want to close care gaps. So those are the same end goal, just different routes. And so if we work together, sometimes we can even augment um, individuals' uh, staffing, right? You know, I, I always tell, you know, quality directors at an ICO or a friendly qualified health clinic or even a health system, look at me as an extra set of hands. I can help you reach your goals and you can help me reach mine. And so, you know, you, you said it, right? Sometimes, often, oftentimes it comes down to um, the purse, right? It comes down to keeping organizations sustainable and keeping them open. And I'm and I'm 100% okay with having that conversation. But great yeah, question. I, I think it's interesting. Um, I mean, when, one of the things that we do, right? You mentioned HEDIS measures. It's like we need our organization internally just needs to transition into a more of a uh, an outcomes oriented measurement system versus like a process oriented measurement system. And I think that that's like very clearly. Or I hear that kind of reflected in the same thing that you're saying. It's like, how are we making sure that we're adhering to ACA or AHA guidelines versus mm -hmm. just making sure that these processes are done from the standpoint of the provider, right? Like, it's just an interesting kind of dilemma. And the, the ability to fix that is so much easier said than done, you know? So, oh, man. Nathan, you, <laughs> it's like you're, you're absolutely in my head right now. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, oftentimes payers are just doing things for compliance sake. Right. Um, how can we stay compliant and not end up in receivership? Right. And so, but ultimately, you know, Nathan, and you'll see as you progress in your career, it sounds like you're going in the right direction. Um, but when you'll see that it's not just payers, right? Our healthcare system as a whole has gotten used to the status quo. Just keep the lights on, stay in compliance, you know, keep CMS out of your hair. We have to get out of that. We have to get more focused on and more aligned with better health outcomes. I think that's why we all got into this space. Nobody got into this space to just keep the doors open, right? We got into this space to help individuals, right? Um, so, you know, but it's hard when the day-to-day -day is, you know, just putting fires out, right? And so at some point during that day, when you're definitely putting fires out, we have to have conversations about how we can, you know, work a little bit more upstream to improve better health outcomes. Thank you, Cindy, Cindy. I think you oh. have your hand, Cindy. Well, actually, there's a there's a question in the chat that we'll go to um, if you'd like to unmute and ask. Hi, Mr. Ranjo. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the community's response to efforts to integrate care and um, especially in terms of the AHA's efforts because they're I'm sure there is a sort of um, gap in, in, a, in knowledge, like understanding exactly, uh, especially when it comes to like CPR and uh, care that can be provided by bystanders. Mm -hmm. So you could talk about that a little bit. Integrate care. Um, so yeah, I, I'll start with CPR and, um, you know, we, we've definitely seen an influx in organizations faith-based organizations, um, community development corporations, um, a more of a shared 
uh, responsibility when it comes to improving overall out of hospital cardiac arrest rates. Um, the city of Detroit uh, is almost dead last um, in the um, in the country when it comes to survival rate for out of hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and so I think that the age that we've we've been we've been trying to get the the awareness out of those rates, and I think that it's it's done a good job. Um, because we've seen an influx in, in, in I, I would say, non-traditional or non-healthcare organizations that are more interested um, in, in integrating, you know, CPR training and, and other, um, you know, CPR-related um, um, educational opportunities within their organization. Um, but we have a we have a ton of work to do um, when it comes to integrating, you know, CPR education, but also integrating behavioral health. Um, We've definitely seen an influx of the need for that, especially during the pandemic. Um, so we have a long way to go, um, but I do think that there's been ground softening that has been happening for the last um, several years when it comes to welcoming non-medical uh, or you know non-traditional organizations to the table and really figuring out how we can create more community health initiatives um, that integrate you know, behavioral health, uh, CPR, um, and other things that can potentially be administered or, you know, um, be championed. Um, we, we, we use that word champion a lot, um, or ambassadors um, in the community. Uh, we really, really try to create um, community clinic linkages um, that can reinforce care in, in non-healthcare or non-clinical settings. Um, so it's easy, easier said than done. Um, we have a long way to go, but I've been, um, you know, I've been, um, I've been enthusiastic of, uh, about the the energy and the uh, and the interest of organizations that are looking to um, to really help facilitate those those opportunities in the community. Thank you. Absolutely, Cindy, you had your hand up. Sure, Michael, this is just wonderful. Um, and your, your passion for what you do really comes through. And um, I was really struck by you talking about how public health found you. And um, it's a great example and something I often tell students about, you know, walk through that open door. You don't mm -hmm. know what's gonna be and you gotta try it out. And even if it's a little bit different than what you think you're going after, mm -hmm. you never quite know where it's gonna take you. Um, so thank you for sharing your story. Um, my question is more on uh, many years ago, before I started working for the university, um, I was working for a government contractor that did a lot of work for the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of work on alcohol, tobacco, and other drug prevention. Mm -hmm. And back then, and this is mid nineties or early nineties, it was like, we really had a hard time pushing the idea of prevention because it was, I mean, while people sort of understood it, and I think we all understand if you prevent something from happening, um, it's a good thing. And that happens with heart disease, certainly. Mm -hmm. but, um, but because we really couldn't put a dollar amount on it, mm -hmm. it was sort of a hard sell. So, um, mm -hmm. Do you have a sense in the policy world now of is the prevention argument stronger um, or being being heard and being acted on? Well, certainly in heart disease, um, it, it's really really hard to fundraise um, on research when the 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 entire research community says that about eighty to ninety percent of heart disease is preventable. Right. And so you got to work in prevention when it's just overwhelming in terms of the risk factors that, you know, um, that lead to cardiovascular disease and stroke and, you know, looking at diet and, and sodium levels and, um, and, and exercise and the impact that that has on, you know, your cardiovascular health. Um, so we've seen a lot of, of funding um, in the prevention side. I mean, I pretty much work in the prevention um, side. A lot of the work that we do in the community around policies, uh, systems, and environmental changes are, are, are geared toward prevention. So I, I, I do see um, you know, a number of, of opportunities in that space. And I think that the community has kind of um, has got with the program, if you will, um, on prevention when it comes to funding for that. Um, for tobacco and, and, and substance abuse, it's difficult. It's really difficult. It's extremely political. It's extremely political. 
um, when it comes to um, to choice, right, and 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 preference, right. We're seeing that in vaping as well. Um, you know, you may have parents who say, "Hey, it, it, at least they're not smoking a pack of cools." You know what I mean? Like this is, you know, so it, um, is vaping a form of prevention for more traditional, uh, you know, uh, tobacco usage, right? And so, I guess when I say political, I mean it falls into do polarizing schools of thought, right? Um, so it's it's difficult to um, to fund things around prevention when it comes to that if it's such a, a, a hot button item and it's very contested um, that can really mess up a grant cycle right you know what I mean you're you're putting in a, a narrative to get this program funded and then you're you're having people even on the the, plan, uh, the planning committee that have these you know very polar um, you know viewpoints um, and that that's what my experience has been. Um, you know, I was just thinking about D.A.R.E., right? I, I'm a kid of the 90s, and so I, I believe that D.A.R.E. was very effective. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember my D.A.R.E. classes. I remember the sheriff um, um, department coming into our classrooms and giving us those D.A.R.E. bumper stickers, right? Um, I never used those type of drugs. I mean, I, I think it was very effective. I, I mean, it wasn't like those drugs weren't available, but I, I remember those those D.A.R.E. classes, and I... I um, I recently just looked up an article and it was like dare was 100% not effective <laughs> like it, in some instances it increased the usage of it right so again these very polar you know experience that they're, they're and and all of it is qualitative right everybody is like well did it work i don't know what are the numbers right and so um you know that's something that's a challenge that we've had um you know we we have fantastic partners like the CVS foundation who just believes in this, right? Like they removed tobacco products from their stores, right? And then their stock price went up, right? And so, um, you know, what we've been seeing is, you know, organizations like, I'm going to take a leap of faith because I just know that this is probably what we should be doing. And CVS, um, you know, has been one of those partners that said like, look, we're just going to do this because we know that this is the right thing to do. So I don't know the answer to the question exactly, but um, that's kind of been my experience. And um, and yeah. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I just want to make one other comment is somebody very close to me who was a recovering alcoholic um, mm. was, you know, well into recovery from alcohol, uh, alcohol and then gave up smoking. Mm. She said to me, it was far more difficult to give up smoking than alcohol. Wow to show just what a you know, strong drug that is, so. Absolutely, and, that, and, and that's what we're seeing. Um, you know, look what the vaping industry has done. And, you know, we would do, you know, before COVID, we would do um, community conversations at some of the largest, you know, schools in the state. And we would have people outside protesting, you know, protesting the right to, you know, consume substances. And, you know, so it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting um, space to work in and navigate, um, and and you know your your um, you know your the, your story about your friend um, are stories that we typically use when it comes to you know uh, working with you know with Lansing and 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 maybe doing uh, phone calls to uh, to to lawmakers and, and galvanizing some of our volunteers. Um, we typically don't go to charts and, and pie charts and graphs. We we use stories like that. You know, we use these very personal and and um, and, and very personal anecdotes that help to uh, potentially usher in funding and resources to help uh, you know create opportunities for prevention. Keep up the good work. <laughs> I'll let you know how it goes. I'm in the fight. <laughs> Michael, I had a question for you. I was wondering, how do you navigate equity in the state of Michigan? Um, you know, I'd like to joke around <clears throat> pretty much one giant farm surrounded by water with, you know, like a, with a baker's dozen of cities, uh, half of which are very suburban and the other half are very, very urban, very black. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you are faced with different health issues, do you run into any barriers trying to have specific focus in these communities or, um, you know, how, how do you, how does the, you and the organization kind of navigate the different spaces within our state? Absolutely, great question. Um, 
uh, I'll start with personally. So personally, I'm a black man. So, you know, anytime I come into the room, I bring myself with me hundred uh, percent. I'm a black man. I come from a primarily African-American um, community um, and I've lived these barriers myself. Um, so uh, you cannot tell me <laughs> what someone is experiencing or what you think someone is experiencing until you've lived it. I've lived it. So I, I bring those experiences with me and I, um, and I would encourage anyone that's on this call or is going to view this call to do the same. You have to bring yourself into conversations, especially when it comes to your profession, um, your, your specialty, and, and, um, and where uh, you work in your focus area. And that goes for African-Americans, it goes for other minorities, LGBTQ, um, women. You have to bring that experience with you because you are an advocate for, um, for said community, period. Um, so I really, really strongly advocate for that. Um, when it comes to healthcare, uh, quality of care and health outcomes is absolutely in health as a, is absolutely in health equity issue, right? Um, the numbers do not lie. Individuals in certain demographics and populations and geographical areas are disproportionately impacted by chronic disease. It is that simple, and so. If we want to target a focus group or a specific area, a geographical area, um, we're using the data. You know, the American Heart Association is a, is a science-based organization. We've, we've funded research close to $5 billion for the last 90 to 100 years. And so the things that we do in terms of initiatives and focus area is very seeped and rooted in science and data. So if I work with a fairly qualified health clinic in the city of Flint and their population uh, health data shows that they have a hypertension control rate within this clinic of 30%. And I also look at their demographic and their demographic is 80% African-American. Then we need to go into that clinical partnership with an understanding of how hypertension impacts uh, African-American individuals. Period. Uh, what me and Nathan were talking about in terms of uh, improving quality of care and care gaps, right? So now you overlay that with social determinants. And you look at the education level. You look at their access to transportation. You look at their housing, right? You have to take those factors into consideration. You have to, or you're not going to improve those care gaps. If you have community health workers that are on your staff that are familiar with these barriers, the population is being disproportionately impacted by these chronic conditions. If you don't look at the social determinants, you're not going to be able to treat them, period. So um, that's working way, way, way upstream. Um, but you have to approach these things with, help, um, with, with an equity lens. Um, and it's about looking at the science and about looking at the data. Um, so that's how we navigate. I think the American Art Association is doing a tremendous job. You know, where there's areas where, where I'm critical. But when it comes to this, I think that we're doing a tremendous job. Um, because we're letting the data drive our initiatives, our resources, and our focus area. Um, and, you know, I cover the entire state of Michigan. Um, so, you know, looking at county level, city level data to figure out where to pinpoint initiatives um, and, and where to solve problems. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I was wondering, does, oh, we have another, another question if you'd like to unmute. Um, sorry. Um, following that last point, um, I just wanted to ask, has there ever been an instance where there was um, a need or a desire for a certain kind of intervention on, or effort, but there wasn't enough data to support that? Like, but you probably have um, input from the community or from experts that this is something we should try. Um, so, so, so not really in my purview, you know, the American Art Association, um, what I will say is that we're, we're very focused. And so we have, um, certain, uh, areas that we want to influence and impact. Um, and so there may be an instance where, um, individuals may want the American Art Association to do specific things, um, and what we do is we try to look within our goals as an organization 
um, look at our uh, impact goals when it comes to increasing life expectancy by uh, 2024. Um, you have to be extremely focused and disciplined if you're going to get to those uh, goals, right? And so we might have an, an organization that might come to us and say, you know what, Michael, you know, I want, you know, the American Art Association to do a health fair in my community, right? Um, we have to look at those initiatives and really figure out if it's going to move us forward in terms of um, uh, uh, increasing life expectancy, which is the overall goal. Um, so could that health fair where we're doing blood pressure screening? Absolutely, that could, that could definitely make an impact, a micro impact in that community. More people are screened for, 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 for blood pressure and then more people are connected with primary care, right? Or we could take a step back and we can work with the local health system to create a continuing screening opportunity for all patients under a certain demographic or income level that they can get those screenings for free year round, right? So now you've gone from a 20 to 30 person impact to 20 to 30,000. That's kind of how we have to look at opportunities. So I will say that there, there's never been an instance in my tenure that we've, you know, not had the data to support a certain initiative. Wherever you see people, you'll see heart disease. And so we're needed everywhere. But we have had to take a very focused approach to our 2024 impact goal, um, really looking at a population level and figuring out how we can, um, how we can best serve the, the needs of, of our partners. Thank you. Lasagna? I got, I got a question along, along those lines. Oh, sorry, Lasagna. That's all right. Go for it. You already asked the question. My bad. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I think about you know your role at the American Heart Association, and I think about how does the American Heart Association define success for you and your team, and then what are the challenges that you face with achieving it? Um, and then the third part is how can the University of Michigan resources help you to achieve that? Oh man, well the, the last one is an easy one. So I'll start with the hard one. Um, how do we de define success? So, um, you know, we, we've been blessed with a tremendous brand. So, you know, people know, they see the heart and torch, they know what the American Art Association is. They pick up, they pick up a box of Cheerios, they pick up a, a, you know, a thing of almonds and they see a little heart check. Um, you know, we have a tremendous brand, right? Um, but when because we have a tremendous brand and a, a, a tremendous uh, awareness of who we are, it comes with a huge responsibility, right? Um, you know, heart disease is still the number one killer. You know, I've been with the American Heart Association for three and a half years. It was the number one killer three and a half years ago. It still is today, even among a global pandemic. Um, so defining success, in, in, in my opinion, is, is looking at those three buckets that I mentioned um, in, in my introduction. Um, supporting our partners, supporting our clinical partners, um, supporting our community partners, um, and, um, and, and supporting our community initiatives and engagements. Um, if I've covered those three uh, areas and, and, and my team as well has covered those three areas, then you can sleep well at night. Heart disease will probably be the number one killer tomorrow morning, um, but we've definitely moved toward more individuals um, leading longer and healthier lives free of chronic conditions, right? Um, you know, some of the reciprocity comes in on the patient level, um, and, and Nathan probably appreciate this because he gets to connect directly with patients. I don't get that as much uh, anymore, um, but when I do, you really see the work in motion. Um, we do a, a, a lot of education um, modules with patients that, you know, of our FQHC partners, our clinical partners that are looking to reduce their, they've gotten a diagnosed hypertensive and they're really trying to work um, to reduce that reading. So, you know, we give them nutrition support, we give them education. Um, so sometimes I'm able to do those and that's really awesome, really being able to see their reciprocity on that level, on the patient level, really taking ownership and agency of their health. Um, but, um, that's that personally that helps me that that gives me some reciprocity that I know that we're moving in the right direction. Um, you know, when it comes to success, we again, um, you know, piggybacking off my previous uh, point, 
about you know population level and, and the AHA being very focused. We have very specific goals every single year in terms of our number of engagements, what we're focusing on in terms of policy systems and environmental changes, and, and how we're improving uh, the clinical experience uh, for patients, no matter where they come from, walk of life, ethnicity, um, gender, um, whenever you enter the clinical setting, um, and if you're hyper, uh, if you're diagnosed with a chronic condition, you should receive the best care possible. And we can actually track that. And, you know, we can look at our health outcomes, um, and we can look at uh, levels uh, in our blood pressure readings, um, and and figure out on a population level if your patients are getting healthier and improving their uh, their health. Um, and so we have mechanisms in which we can we can track that with our clinical partners um, to see if they are adhering to these guidelines. And that is, um, um, and that those guidelines are actually improving people's health outcomes. So that's how we kind of measure success um, on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, to the question about, you know, how the the university um, can be involved, uh, this is is fantastic. I I feel like um, I really kind of cracked the nut. <laughs> I mean, there, there's been years of, you know, I, and I, Lasonia, we, we've talked about this. There's been years of reaching out to the university and I feel like I just met the right person. I um, mean, I met the right person again and now we're here. Um, so um, I think that continuing this um, is, is, is extremely important. Um, we do have shared values. We do have shared goals. And we have a, a fantastic, awesome um, uh, health system um, through the University of Michigan um, that has several clinics all throughout the state of Michigan um, that has some of the best researchers in the world, um, that has some of the best faculty in the world. Um, the impact that we can make from Southeast Michigan uh, can have a global impact. I mean, we have the shared um, network and awareness and resources to actually have a global impact from where we are. Um, and so we need to continue to grow this relationship from where it's at um, with that understanding that we can have a very um, catalytic, catalytic um, impact on the rest of the world. Um, and um, I forgot your third, um, the third part of your question. <laughs> That was it. The third part was about the, how the university could. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Nathan, if you'd like to circle back. That was part of my, that was actually perfect. <laughs> part of my question anyways. I got those notes down perfectly. All right, do we, do we have any more questions? It's been a great conversation. I would like to give a, a, a shameless plug for our, for our work uh, through the PCLP and, and everything that we've been able to do. And uh, hopefully it's been a, a big benefit to the, um, you know, to the AHA and, and the communities that you are uh, representing. If you don't mind, would you uh, mind just giving kind of a brief, um, kind of brief description of what we've done and, and, the, and the work that you hope that uh, our students' research will help spur? For sure, for sure. So, um, you know, it's definitely been a um, a breath of fresh air, a, a really a jolt of energy, uh, getting the students involved. Um, you know, Karina and Sharon are, are doing an amazing job, um, really helping us uh, define uh, how students, uh, well, how faculty in public school can um, help support students when it comes to uh, this issue of vaping. Um, so the, the first semester, um, Bria and, um, and Aaron, um, you know, did a great job really looking at um, how we can look at public uh, records and, and, and public data and create a scoring system uh, for where schools were in terms of their, um, uh, of the, the, the level of punitive behavior, if you will, within those policies, right? Um, the American Heart Association doesn't believe, um, and, and again, the data and the, um, and the science backs it up, that, that punitive measures will help prevent uh, tobacco usage. It just doesn't. If you kick a kid out of school, they're more than likely to continue to use, if not increase their usage, because now they're at home, and now they're dealing with um, 
um, you know, with uh, with disciplinary issues with their parents. Um, and now they're either kicked off the football team, the basketball team, the cheer squad. Um, so that doesn't help. <laughs> um, and also they're getting further and further behind in their studies, which also doesn't help because now they're academically performing poorly and it just compounds and exacerbates. You get the you get the drift. Um, so you know what uh, what what Aaron and Brenna were able to do was help us uh, define a scoring system of school policies um, and really figure out where they were um, and how we could potentially engage based on that score. So if they scored low in terms of their punitive measures, then the AHA could potentially come in and help craft policy that helps uh, support that school if they're not doing punitive measures first, not kicking kids out of school on their first or second um, possession uh, charge, right? Um, if they score higher on, on that scorecard, um, those schools probably were very punitive in nature and the AHA potentially would have to work through um, several conversations with, uh, with school leadership and staff to really figure out where there may be some synergy or some areas that we may be able to redirect and help define a policy and craft a policy that's more supportive to students. Um, so that was the first iteration of students. Now we're working with um, uh, with Sharon and Karina, and and they're really uh, helping us craft um, um, ways in which to uh, engage school staff. Um, so Karina is a registered nurse. Um, so we're really uh, excited to have her aboard um, because what they found in their research is that. Um, school nurses are typically the individual within a public school that are spearheading um, um, anti-vaping campaigns within their um, student population and also figuring out ways to help craft policies and, uh, and school policies that are, um, that are more supportive in nature. Um, so with that finding, um, we are approaching schools, um, hearing them out, and then developing strategies, not only on the policy side, but also on the student engagement side, you know, working with the National Health, um, the National Honor Society, um, you know, working with other, you know, national um, uh, student body organizations to really figure out how we can create um, awareness campaigns um, with students along with, uh, you know, crafting that policy. So it's been, it's been amazing. Um, you know, I, like you know, DeAndre said earlier, I wear several hats. Um, and so having that, um, you know, additional uh, brain power and, and charisma around these, um, around these issues is, is really, really, really valuable. Um, and I think that this year, having the students a little longer, um, we're definitely going to be able to make some more headway. My goal uh, within the practicum is for us to actually change policies within the, the time frame that we have, right? Um, I want students to come in um, and, and leave and being able to put a feather in their cap and saying like, hey, we were able to actually craft policy that was enacted. And be, as a result of my work, um, you know, students are being more supported. So that's a little bit of what we're doing. Um, it's a little bit more detailed than that probably, but um, it's 5.30 and it's late and it's dark outside. <laughs> No, understandable. That I think that's the uh, the best way to to end end this off. Thank you, everyone, so much for attending and all your wonderful questions. It's been a great dialogue. Uh, if everyone can unmute and join me in uh, thanking Michael for his time, really appreciate it. Michael, this was great. Thank you, Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. This is been oh, great. Thank absolutely. Thank oh. you. All. This is great. And thank you for being, just say also thank you for being such a wonderful partner. Oh no! Thank you all. Like this is um, this is absolutely um, uh, this is definitely a result of of, of several years um, uh, cultivating a relationship with University of Michigan. Um, definitely want to say thank you to you all as well, um, and DeAndre, Cindy, uh, Lasonya, uh, Miriam, all you. This is this is fantastic. It really is. And um, also want to thank uh, Linda Lawrence, who's the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Michigan Health System. Um, she, she's been awesome as well. So I'm really uh, encouraged by this partnership and really looking forward to the work that we're gonna continue to accomplish in the years to come. Awesome. Well, uh, as Miriam put in the chat, please look out for our next uh, Young Leaders that'll be on the 16th. 
uh, with uh, Andrea LaFontaine, the executive director for Michigan Trails and Greenways Alliance and a former state legislator. So P3 is always trying to offer uh, as many opportunities as we can for, for our students and be a resource to everyone. Uh, with that being said, I'll say have a great day, but by looking outside, I, should, I guess I should say have a great night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Thank you. Take care.